Thanks very much. I'm very happy to be with you uh, here today. Um, we're going to look at where are we at in terms of the response to HIV AIDS in Asia and the Pacific, and what needs to be done to achieve the new targets of 95, 95, 95. So where are we? Globally, there's a decline of 31% over the last decade. In Asia and the Pacific, it's 21% decline. And of course, that hides a lot between different countries and the pace of change. But as you can see on this slide, we're still a long way from achieving both the targets for 2020 and more importantly, 2030, when we're supposed to achieve the new targets. So there's a lot of change required if we're going to seriously achieve the goals of the new strategy and the agreements of member states in the new political declaration that was just agreed uh, this year. So where are we at for the region? The latest data tells us where new infections are occurring. This means program change is required. 53% of new infections are occurring among men who have sex with men. Yet many countries have not got the right type of programs in place to focus on this population. And there's increasing stigma and discrimination that is a barrier that needs to be overcome. You can see second to this, people who inject drugs. Similar negative responses on this, rather than the proactive public health responses required, which both address HIV and the intersection of drug dependence. And so having a different approach to this area would be critical to success. Sex work and other areas, we've seen some improvements over time. And, and you'll see this uh, throughout the presentation today. Here, young people is the other critical new factor we need to look at. We have new wave epidemics. In some countries, you could talk about two different epidemics, the long-standing older epidemic and a new epidemic. Look at the figures here in the top left column. In the graph here, Philippines, 216% among the young in the last decade. And that's largely in, in the last few years. And, and other countries from Malaysia across, and you can see the increase is continuing among young people. The bottom left quadrant, you can see where are we at against the regional average, 26% across the region. And you can see where countries are above that in terms of new infections amongst the young. So that means new approaches, new ways of reaching young people. Young people do not respond to the old established programs. They live in a whole different way uh, and a different lifestyle than we did. That's the internet, it's mobile technology, it's different social networking. These issues need to be adjusted. The top right quadrant, you can see the pace of change um, and it varies across different countries, just as examples. One of the biggest barriers for young people to know their status, to be able to engage in protecting their own health and understanding their health issues is that for many, they can't access health services without parental consent. And you can see there has been some improvements recently with countries giving um, either access um, without parental consent in the case of 17 countries or reducing the age um, that people can access, young people can access services without parental consent. But we still have 14 countries or 37% where you know it's 18 and people are very sexually active in a number of places before that or taking other risks. So they need to be able to engage in protecting themselves and understanding their health. So this is a critical barrier to, to many. Pre-exposure prophylaxis is a critical new thing. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Where are we at across the region? We've had substantial change in, uh, in recent years. And there's a partnership with the World Health Organization and UNAIDS um, where we co-financed um, technical support across the Asia Pacific, a significant way of bringing together different agencies with their expertise, and more importantly, the national partners were there to support. But when you look at this, and you can see by the color coding, where PrEP, if we start with planning, there are a few countries still planning, some have started piloting or just post pilot, but even at the national scale, when you look at the yellow dots, what level of scale? And that's the critical difference. Just saying we have a PrEP program doesn't mean much if you, we don't see the scale of coverage and service availability. So good progress, but still a long way to go. This is a critical new tool. We've seen the evidence from many countries in our region. 
from Australia to other countries like Thailand, Vietnam, where they're seeing reductions um, uh, in new infections. And, and so this is a, a critical area of new intervention that needs to continue to increase. Lagging behind overall though on prevention, and you can see in this graph, the 95% target, the new target, where are we? Only um, Cambodia has reached that for female sex workers and gone above it. Cambodia is doing well for most groups. Men of sex with men though are lagging behind. And you can see the red dots on the left of the 50% mark. And the majority of the countries are way below that. Thailand's on the border. of Some programs for sex work, better prevention programs, but the rest, we've still got a long way to go. And this is a serious challenge. This needs significant impact and program design change in countries to get prevention to move forward. Testing, similarly, we have some challenges here. Testing has been improved overall, but you can see across the key populations, where are we at and, and where are the groups that are lagging behind? So the data is available to countries. We have detailed information by country that can help them understand where do they need to lift? Where do they need to focus their efforts in terms of getting key populations into testing? Because there's a whole range of benefits from testing, knowing your status just to know um, for your own health sake, knowing then about treatment options and how that can benefit you and your family and the community. Types of testing. This is where we're working with a range of partners and we need to see increased change. Community-based testing is available. In the past, testing was largely about counting numbers, and so it was strategic information data gathering. But the program implementation of it is increased. The community is critical to it. The lay providers, it drops down. And again, self-testing. In this era of young people who live their lives on the internet and using mobile technology and virtual space um, tools, we need to give them the tools. The other issue with self-testing that makes it a critical area for investment and change is that with stigma and discrimination as a major barrier for many people at country level, they don't access services, fixed site services. Their fear of being identified by a risk behavior or, uh, or some issue in their life that is um, um, socially unacceptable, that stops them from accessing. If they can test at home, then that engages them with the health system. And there's great examples from India across many different countries of where this is working, but we don't have anywhere near the level we need. And, and social networking also is another area uh, that we need to see increased work where the networks themselves, and this is again, particularly for the young and marginalized populations where they can communicate amongst their community about the needs. So the gaps to summarize, when we look at the targets here, we have, over a million people still need to know their status. So we're a long way from achieving the testing to start with. And then we move into getting people who are tested into treatment. And there is a big drop off. And this is a challenge for a number of countries. And there are targeted number of countries that really need to get that connection. So what's the barrier holding people back after they know their HIV positive status of getting into treatment? And that needs to be addressed. It's the the structural barriers that hold people back. Stigma and discrimination, access to treatment, cost is not the barrier in most places now. So there are issues here around the service environment. Viral suppression is really important because we see the long-term benefits to the individual of their own health, but also then protective benefits that are well understood now with U equals U, and we'll come to that. So achieving viral suppression is critical. Access to testing services is a major part of that, the viral assays, so people understand it. So there are gaps, some positive progress, but we've got a way to go. On the right, you can see by young people, by women, um, and by men. Dolgotrivir is a critical tool in terms of treatment. And this is because it's more effective and has a benefit. But you know, when we, when we look at only 11 countries have introduced it as part of their um, first line regimen, that's only 29%, we're still a long way to go. Some have it as an alternate, but it should be in the first line for all countries. And, and we even see 8%, it's not included as all and others um, are still not clear on, on the placement, uh, haven't reported it. So, but we have a big gap here and it started, it's in plans, it's in programs, but the implementation is behind for our region. The drug resistance is an issue with this because we, we see on the left of this, all first line 
ART initiators. And where do we see drug resistance? Look at PNG, high levels of drug resistance. And then on the right for PNG, you look at people who are drug naive, 12.3% of first line people accessing treatment for the first time have drug resistance. So that means there are strains of resistance building up in the community. Prior ARV drug exposure is an issue. That means there are gaps in, in people's treatment program. So they're either not able to access the treatment in a continued fashion and, and supply um, is a challenge for it. Or service delivery challenges, PNG, 42%. That is so high. And so you can see these are examples for the region. Dolgotrivir is a major part of how this can um, be addressed and improved. So that's why it's critical. HIV and COVID significant intersectionality issues. And you look in the column in the middle here, and the same issues that we've been dealing with for so long on HIV are major barriers and um, causing impact of COVID to be more substantial for individuals in communities, be that their status around income and access through employment, you know, issues of um, uh, access to healthcare and insurance, you know, incarceration in prisons and detention centers, you know, laws, local policies that give preference to some over others, the same issues we've been dealing with with HIV. That's why you'll hear in the new strategy, the focus is on these issues of inequalities and addressing those. They're critical both for COVID as they are for HIV. What's the impact for us of COVID on HIV? Look at the access to ARV, the treatment scaler. 20 uh, across the Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific, you can see there's a reduction um, of net increase in 2020 compared to 2019. And only 5% increase in the last year in access to treatment. So service interruption, program interruption. Look at Pakistan, Timor-Leste, the Philippines, India, major interruptions between the programs that they had in place. And you can see it across the board in many countries. So COVID had, ha has had and continues to have a direct impact in both prevention, but here importantly in treatment scale up. And that's critical if we're going to move forward with achieving 95, 95, 95 targets. There's also been great innovation across the region. Some examples here for you to consider. You know, this includes multi-month dispensing of ARVs, um, differentiated service delivery. So that's reaching to people in their homes rather than having them come to high risk um, uh, fixed sites where their risk of COVID is an issue. There's been opioid substitution, take home doses increased in a number of countries. That's a critical tool. PrEP programs have got around this challenge. You know, our community networks have been sharing examples amongst themselves across the region and globally to show that these programs can be done. Critical importance will be that this is maintained as we work through COVID period and onwards, because this will have a major impact in achieving greater and faster outcomes for the, the new targets. When we look at the targets themselves, this is a really important thing. Member states have come together um, through the global strategy on AIDS, but also through the high level meeting and the commitments they have made um, in June of this year to achieve the new targets. We didn't achieve 2020 targets for um, uh, our region. So we need to see that change that's going to achieve these targets, the 95% targets for the key areas of the program. But in addition, there are the 10% targets, and these are critical. 10% of countries having punitive laws and policies. So that means a significant reduction in our region for some countries with punitive laws. Um, less than 10% of countries experiencing, or, or the communities experiencing stigma and discrimination. Again, major structural barrier that we're facing across the region, and it's growing in some places. And less than 10% of people experience gender inequality and violence. Another reason why HIV has to be part of a broader agenda focused on inequalities. The inequalities lens is at the center of the new global aid strategy, and that is critical to us. When we look at these issues that are holding back the responses in many of our countries, it's about the, the institutional barriers. It's about the stigma, the discrimination, the service access. And so that's why the inequalities. And if you recall the slide that brought together the two of COVID and HIV and the central column of these inequalities, this is critical. And that's why it's at the heart of the new strategy. And that will change the way 
UN aids and many partners will operate. And that's what we need to see change at country level. Let's address the inequalities because that's what's holding back prevention. It's holding back the testing. It's holding back the treatment access. M moving forward, what do we need to see? The scale up obviously of combination prevention led by key pops, particularly the young engaged in the program design and delivery, PrEP, the self-testing, transition of treatment to uh, Dulgotrivia um, in the first line. Same day ART, multi-month dispensing. A lot of this is known, but we're not seeing the pace of change fast enough. The differentiated service delivery, that we really need to see continue, and the examples given as part of COVID is a critical way that we can see that this can really make a difference. Non-traditional partners are going to be critical for universal health coverage as they are for HIV, and we need to see the role of community. The sustainable financing, the engagement of community, the inequalities issues of um, addressing stigma, the barriers, women's rights, empowerment issues, all the issues that we're very familiar with, people-centered approaches, looking at human rights and innovation. Our targets across the treatment spectrum, we need to see that change. And that means getting people tested and getting them straight into treatment. And importantly, working on viral suppression. I, I've taken um, uh, the time to put up here for you to consider U equals U, which is a new concept for many, but a critical one for a whole range of reasons and benefits. Be that for the individual who real, once they realize that being on ARV, and achieving undetectable levels, and that's where the viral um, suppression, that the testing is important, viral testing is important, that means they are not going to transmit HIV sexually. And that's clearly understood, WHO, many um, like the US Centers of Disease Control and many other partners across the globe have proven this is evidence-based. Accessing treatment as soon as they're diagnosed and retained in care is critical for a number of reasons, but also because it will motivate when people realize that if they achieve viral suppression, undetectable HIV, they can't transmit. It makes a big difference to how they see their futures and how they can see themselves and their families continuing and they'll live the same lifespan as the average person in society. So, but they will need um, increased access to viral load assays at affordable prices. So countries need to work together to look at how the prices can come down and making lab systems more effective for this. Combination prevention needs to be a key part and the whole issue of U equals U needs to be brought into our prevention program to understand the benefits of treatment for prevention in, in this context. So to conclude, we need to reach people, and in this environment, let's think about those hidden key populations, particularly young, particularly the young who are online. How do we reach them? How do we find them? That's changing the nature of our program. Differentiated approaches, the interventions that need to be scaled up and the scale is critical, not just introducing them, but scaling them up to the right level. Integrated packages of services, the role of the community in program implementation, the right structures. This is UHC, universal health coverage requires strong community participation to achieve its outcomes. Pursue data-driven approaches, look at the financing, the policy, the institutional barriers, those inequalities of stigma and discrimination, the rights that people are not able to enjoy and keeps them away from health services, including HIV, violence in society, and ongoing in the immediate period, the next few years, COVID and the challenges. We've seen adaptations and successful programs with this. We need to see that continue and scaled up and maintain, particularly these innovative differentiated service delivery models and multi-month dispensing and a significant increase on these. I hope this has given some ideas, food for thought, the discussion and during the course of the program, you'll hear from many different partners and giving good examples from country level on how they are responding to the changes that are required. Thank you very much for your time.